Okay. Welcome, welcome to my easy urban gardening planning webinar. So we're just gonna have a little, little moment to get people in. And in the meantime, you might want to share in the share in the chat where you're from, where you're joining from. I myself, I am joining from a little town called Bar in the canton of Zug in Switzerland which is in between Zurich and Luzerne. It's kind of like what more people, cities that more people know. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm already telling you, I'm a very curious person. <laughs> very good. I'm Marit and I'm in Stalikon between Zurich and Zug. So I'm not very far off from you. Ah, okay. Oh, I have somebody from uh from Lausanne let's see and I'm also between Zurich and Zug you're also and between Zurich. so everybody's kind of like almost in that well no I see Nicolette she's from the Netherlands Bremgarten Aargau that's not far away either <laughs> that is that is nice so we're just kind of like letting know in the chat where we're from um, we had horrible, horrible weather today, although thank God, not the storm like uh, the northern part of Europe uh, had. I mean, I know a couple of people, I'm originally from the Netherlands, so I know a few people there, they had kind of like a lot of damage and in England where my sister was living, it was the same, but nevertheless, it was kind of like horrible here. But uh, my, my, my gardening fingers are itching because it's almost the end of the elf end of february come on guys what's going on mother nature give us a bit of sunshine but even without the sunshine it is important to make a plan and that's why we're here so i'm gonna share my screen and you should now be able to see my screen so i want to thank you all once again for joining me tonight and as I said, my gardening fingers are really itching. So I'm totally thrilled to take you through my three simple steps towards your 2022 garden plan. Just to make sure that we're all here with the same expectations. We're not here for park garden design. <laughs> and we're not here to talk about roses or hydrangeas or viburnum, things like that. With me, it's all about vegetables, fruits, herbs, and edible or beneficial flowers. They are allowed in the garden, of course. So you are in the right place if you love vegetables and want to grow them yourself. And if you want to maximize your garden's potential. And in many of your cases, that might also be maximized the limited space you have. So if that's the case, you're in the right place and we are going to have a fun little hour together. So what can you expect in the next hour or so? Um, I will tell you a bit about my garden and my experiences. Um, we will look at some small urban garden designs. I collected some things to inspire you to, especially to show how limited the space available uh, can be used, how, how little space you actually need. Um, then we set our goals for the 2022 gardening season together. I will quickly explain you my special sewing calendar because it has a few tweaks and twerks uh, compared to um, a normal standard sewing calendar. And finally, of course, we're going to make our planning. So um, you can work with me. I'm going to share my screen so you can have a little look in how it goes. And if you work together, you can actually have quite some um, planning done by the end of this webinar. OK, well. Today, I am going to share some lessons from my brand new program with you, which is Your Urban Paradise in Four Weeks. It is a program, an online gardening program that assumes you want to either 
start your garden so you're still working with an empty empty balcony or redesign what you already have to make it more productive and it guides you through the process of designing building planning and sowing your garden but a little bit more about that later for now it is time to get to know each other a little bit better so i want you to uh, ask you to type some answers to the question, to my questions in the chat. And the first question I have for you is what kind of garden do you have? Let me know. It can be a little balcony. It can be an empty balcony. It can be a balcony with pots. It can be nothing. It can be some pots indoors. Let's see some balconies with pots, empty, small balcony. Okay, that is nice. And if you are already gardening in a way of growing your own vegetables, can you let me know how long you're doing that? Are you, are you aiming to start this year or did you maybe already try different things or maybe you're even kind of like a seasoned gardener and, and growing vegetables already for a long time, but just here to get it even more productive or more efficient. So I'm trying it last started last year, new to growing veggies. Love that. Love that. The more new people I can get in, the better it is. <laughs> it's my aim to green as many balconies in town and terraces in town as possible for the next few years. Okay, some some personal challenges already. I go into I, I will go into more detail on your personal questions and personal challenges at the end of the of the webinar. So that's really really cool. And then last but not least, I really like to know your biggest motivation. As I said, I'm kind of like I'm a, I'm naturally quizzy and curious person. So bear with me that I want to know all these things about you, um, but I can already kind of like. Um, Pill a little bean. Uh, my biggest motivation was definitely, definitely health uh, inspired. Um, so I'm really curious what your motivation is. Is it like, you know, fresher has uh, vegetables, more tasty vegetables, um, healthier living environment? Do, do you just want to be more sustainable or um, maybe you want to learn your kids? where vegetables actually come from, that they don't grow packaged in a plastic bag like they are sold in the in the supermarket. So yeah, I see also health, sustainability, taste, having fun. I like that with your son. Well done, Peter. Great. Fresher. Yes, absolutely amazing. Really, really cool. So now that I know so much about you, it's of course time to tell you a little bit about me. I mean, it would be very rude not to do so. I've been quizzing, quizzing you <laughs> uh, for the last few minutes and, um, and it would be kind of like weird not to tell you something about me. Um, so a little bit about me. I love fresh foods, cooking and playing in the dirt. On um, the picture, you see me kind of like trying to maintain my own little corner in my mom's garden. Um, must have I must have been like three years old here. Um, so yeah, I grew up uh, in my mom's kitchen and garden as the sixth generation female chefs in the family. So I know a little bit, a thing or two passed on from generation to generation, uh, from uh, mother to daughter about fresh ingredients, flavor combinations, of course, cooking with it and wining and dining. Uh, I also love to call myself a foodie by birth. I was kind of like, not only raised with it, I think the DNA from my mom and her ancestors is just in my blood. So I cooked privately and professionally all, almost all my life. Um, either with my mom uh, in her kitchen, uh, later also as you know, uh, jobs, uh, side jobs, uh, next to my university degree, uh, with uh, kind of like the highlight um, cooking together with a two Michelin star chef. So that is on the cooking side, I've always been very active. I've always done a lot. I've always been also passionate about it. I still am. I love cooking. 
but I did not garden all my life, uh, although I always had outdoor space. So I was kind of like lucky even at university, I had a tiny little garden, um, but I didn't do it kind of like because of the idea of the hard work. It's what a lot of people think about gardening. You know, it's very physical. You have to crawl on your knees. You're weeding all the time. So no, I actually didn't do it uh, for, um, uh, for a long time. So until 10 years ago, when I moved to Switzerland, as I said, I'm originally from the Netherlands. So I moved to Switzerland uh, 10 years ago with my husband for his job. And here I ended up in a, an apartment with a rooftop terrace, quite a big one. So that's when I kind of like started to increase the little pots with fresh herbs I always had in my kitchen, also because of the, um, of the cooking, of course. I expanded with kind of like one garden bed and a tomato. So still not too much, just to kind of like pimp up um, the, the meal or the salad that we have now and then with something um, homegrown. Uh, until, uh, we're now six years ago, I was uh, diagnosed with cancer. It was a quite aggressive um, kind of breast cancer. And I was, uh, I was uh, on to, I was on to go on to a schedule of 31 chemotherapy sessions and 29 radiotherapy sessions in 17 months. And I kind of like intuitively, I knew instinctively, I knew I had to be really careful about what I was eating if I wanted to stay fit enough and, um, have my, my health, or as far as you can, keep my health good enough to not postpone session after session after session, also because we would go into winter. So I promised myself to do everything to stay as fit as possible, to just go on with the schedule and not um, drag it on into 18, 19, 20, or maybe even 24 months. So that was a little bit easier said than done, but I had some amazing help. And as I have always been catering with my mom, I told you I'm the sixth generation. So she knows a thing or two about fresh ingredients as well. And I had my first garden that you can see in the picture. Um, I sat down with my mom and my husband, who happens to be a pharmacist, to figure out what kind of deficits I could expect and then figure out what I needed to eat to restore those deficits, to balance back whatever I was lacking. And you kind of like might have guessed it by now, but we came up with a diet very rich in vegetables, uh, vegetables and herbs, but also seeds and nuts and pulses and fish. So I was okay. I was doing a little bit more research. And then that research showed me that vegetables lose 50 to 95% of their nutritional value in vitamins and minerals between 24 hours and five days after harvesting. It was kind of like shocking to me. I was like, oh my gosh, if I want to, if I need those vitamins and minerals to stay um, healthy during, especially during my treatment, I have to make sure that they are incredibly fresh and to get them that fresh, say 24 to 48 hours from land to plate, I have to go and kind of like grow them myself. So that's when my little bit of gardening kind of like turned into full-blown gardening. My husband and dad built me a few more of those raised beds, as exactly the same as you see in the picture for my first garden. They mixed the soil that I insisted on and um, I went off to sow my seeds 
and to grow my vegetables. And I actually also, so we had fresh vegetables straight from the garden into the kitchen um, during not only my whole treatment, but also already during winter. And I did not skip one single treatment session. And honestly, I am a little bit proud of that. <laughs> but after, um, after recovery, I had to come to terms with the fact that I would never have children of my own. So no family with children of my own to pass my family legacy on to. And that's when I decided to kind of like adopt the world with all these lovely people like you who love vegetables, who like to cook, who want to eat healthy, who care for the environment and share my knowledge about ingredients, about foods, but also about growing your own vegetables uh, with. And that is how easy urban gardening kind of like was born. So it's specifically designed for raised beds and containers on balconies and terraces or any other small space in town. And it is there to help uh, urbanites enjoy fresh, organic and super tasty vegetables without the big space and exhaustive work. Because for easy urban gardening, you don't need much space. We work on spaces as small as 30 by 30 centimeters, which equals one square foot or any multiple of that. And you don't need much time because you can actually maintain your garden with just five minutes per day. If you are able to get yourself out of your garden, I am not because I just like it so much, but it is possible. You don't need much strength because we work in relatively small gardens. It is mainly designed in raised beds, so it's not the hard physical work of digging and tilling, and there is limited crawling on your hands and knees. And you don't need much know-how because the system is designed to make it as easy as possible. Or, as Birgit said, I liked how easy it was. Um, it was organized each week. I did one simple step and at the end I had a garden started. And Amy, I love that everything is laid out so easily and in such an understandable fashion. So yes, I did everything to make gardening fun, simple, easy to understand and quick to realize. And as I said, I have the joy of growing my own vegetables year round in just five minutes work a day. Although I have to admit, I spent a lot more time in my garden, but that's the time for fun. It's not the time for working in the garden. So are you ready to get your 2022 garden plan done? So we just, let's do it. A planning or sewing calendar for the year only works if you know where you want to go. So we have a few things to do. And it is helpful if you get your workbook because first we're going to create your goals, which means list your vegetables. Then we're going to set an end point. We're going to determine your consumption and then you make your schedule for the season. So if you have your workbook ready, we're going to have a look at worksheet one first. So you can see there is a block and I want you to think about what are your favorite vegetables actually. And to make yourself, your life easy, you might want to pick as many as possible of worksheet two. But feel free to add any other vegetable that you like eating but be really honest and put only on there what you really like. So there is no purpose in growing broad beans if you hate eating broad beans. Or if you don't like zucchini, don't grow zucchini. So just let me know how you're cutting along. 
I don't want to rush you too much. There is no wrong answer, of course, because it's your garden and it's um, it's it's your life, it's your taste. Um, so just be honest with yourself and don't put any vegetables on there because everybody says they're easy to grow or um, everybody should grow X, Y, Z. So if you have your list with the vegetables you like, it is time for step two. And that is, it's kind of like another, another question, which is really important to answer honestly for yourself. How much of those vegetables you just listed will and can you actually eat per harvest round or season? Let me explain that a little bit further. If you like salads, it's easy to say, oh, I like salads. So I'm going to fill up, uh, I don't know, two or three square meters or whatever, a, a fairly big area with lettuce. Yeah, I like salads, so I need a lot of lettuce. But what a lot of gardeners, or especially at the beginning, what they forget is if you like lettuce, you still might only eat two lunch salads and a dinner salad, and maybe use some lettuce on sandwiches in between for lunch during the week which means probably that you might eat two lettuce heads. But if you put a lot of lettuce in your garden, you might end up at the time that they are ready to harvest, you might end up with six lettuce heads, which ones which you might have to eat because it's the temperature goes up. So you might have to eat them within two weeks, which means that not one lettuce head per week, you all of a sudden have to eat three lettuce heads a week or worse, maybe even four. That does take away the fun of a vegetable garden, I can tell you. I can still remember when my mom made that mistake and I was a kid and we were like, not again, zucchini. Please, mom, do as a favorite and just leave them in the garden. Well, she was like, no, I'm not going to have perfectly fine produce, fresh vegetables rot in my garden. You eat zucchini. It does take away the fun of, of vegetable gardening. So be honest, if you love zucchini in, in, in season, but have to be honest, say, I might eat zucchini three times a week. And for that, with my family, I might need two zucchinis every time. So that's six zucchinis. Don't plant six zucchini plants because then you have to eat about 18 zucchinis per week. And you might not want it. And there is also a limit to the amount of vegetables your neighbors want to get from you. <laughs> I can tell you that too. So try to make an honest estimate of how much of your favorite vegetables you actually want to eat. Because planting too much not only means that you kind of like lose your fun in vegetable garden because you have to eat those vegetables. It also means that you won't have space for something else that you like too. So it's the compromise there as well. How much do I like from the one and how much do I like from the other compared to the space? You so that's why it's important to kind of like make to create an idea for yourself about your own consumption. Then I'm kind of like cheating because I thought it, I, I told you it were three steps, but I have a step two and a half. I want to go with you over worksheet two, which is my sewing calendar, because I want to explain to you what it actually tells you. What does this sewing calendar tell you? Um, it tells you a little bit more than most sewing calendars do. Because first of all, the first thing that really catches, catches your eye is the colors. So you have the seven colors and they actually represent the seven main families vegetables belong to. You can go a lot deeper. You can expand it. This is on a level that's kind of like the minimum that you need to know to, to actually have a successful garden. So it's simplified to the max. Seven colors. It's representing seven families. Why is it important to know a little bit or about families or vegetable families? Is because vegetables from the same family use the same nutrition in your soil. So they eat the same, they extract the same minerals and, and, and et cetera from your soil. So if you would only grow the gray family, 
you would actually exhaust the soil and in the end it, they just won't grow as good anymore besides vegetables from the same family also attract the same insects and that might turn those singular or those individual insects actually in a pest which will destroy your crop will destroy your harvest so we don't want to do that so combining as many vegetables as many families uh, within a small garden makes it more fun for you because it keeps your garden more varied. It makes it more sustainable and it actually also improves the health or keeps the health of your garden, read soil, at the highest level. So that's why it's important to have these this, this groups, these families blocked out and to make it really simple, I color coded them. So we just talk, I mean, I did put the name or the, the, the there, but we just call it the gray family or the orange or the red, etc. So then within the block, you see actually see the vegetable, which is on every sowing calendar. So it is radishes, uh, pak choy, like in the gray block and carrots and beetroots in the orange and lettuce and spinach in the, in the green one. So that's just the vegetable that you can grow and I collected here I, I made a group of vegetables that are relatively popular there is something for everybody and they're not the most difficult ones to grow what is kind of like a little bit unique in my calendar is the numbers besides the vegetable uh, the family color coding you see the numbers behind the reddish is four to six those are the amount of weeks it takes from sowing until harvesting. So if you sow your redis today, you it's still a little bit cold. So probably in five to six weeks, you can actually harvest your radishes. And if we go to the carrots in the, in the orange block next to it, it says 10. So from putting the seeds in the soil to harvesting your first carrots is about 10, around about 10 weeks. I'm not saying you can't have your first one at nine weeks already. And of course, you can harvest a little bit longer because you don't have to eat them all at the same time. But it's on average, it's 10 weeks. And then you see the months. So for the radishes, it says March to June and September, October. Those are the months you can actually sow radishes during the year. So for March, so like kind of like next week, you could start, if your soil is not frozen anymore, wherever you, you're living, you can actually start sowing your radishes. And then by the end of the month, or maybe the first week of April, you will actually have your first radishes to harvest. And you can do that all the way through June. July and August are no good months. And then September, October, again, you can sow some radishes. And if you stretch it towards really towards the end in August, in November you can still harvest your fresh homegrown radishes and that goes for all all the vegetables on there there is one little thing that's called the transplants transplants are the real summer vegetables they love high temperatures and sunshine so they but they also need a long time to grow before they produce their fruits like tomatoes or peppers or cucumber, zucchini, and pumpkins. And because they need that extended time to actually give those fruits, but we are living, or most people are living in an area where the spring temperatures are not high enough, those are the ones that you would actually sow indoors. Those is the first set of months that you see. And then after the forward slash, that is when you will actually transplant them into your garden. And there will be already kind of like little plants, not seedlings anymore. They're really kind of like little plants that you will then move into your garden. And that's just because the temperatures kind of like have to be around 15 to 18 degrees during the day and definitely no frost in the night anymore so for the european part where we all live switzerland austria the netherlands germany england 
That is normally the second half of May. So after the 15th of May, um, you can transplant, normally you can transplant them outdoors. So that's kind of like all the information. It's quite a lot of information, but it's on this one worksheet and it tells you actually everything you need to make a sewing plan. And that means that we can go and make a sewing plan. So if you take worksheet three from your workbook, um, you also got an email from me asking you to measure the space you have and maybe even gather a couple of colored pencils. The space we, you need, because it's now up to you, we're, we're, you are now really going to make your plan. So some work is going to be done here now. The space you have, try to divide it in as many 30 by 30 centimeter squares as you possibly can. So if you say I have a, lo a, a long but small, uh, but a narrow balcony, you might have maybe 180 centimeters or maybe even a little bit more than two meters. But it might only be 60 centimeters deep that you can go in a way that you can still stand on your balcony. So that would mean that if you, if you divide it in 30 by 30 centimeters, you would have two rows that go all the way along your balcony. And if that's a little bit more than two meters, that might be seven squares, because that would come to two meter 10. So you would actually in total in your garden, you would have 14, little squares of 30 by 30 centimeters. And if you go smaller, you might have a space of where you can fit in 90 by 60 centimeters, which would give you actually six squares, or maybe even only 60 by 60 centimeter, which would give you three squares. Just to give you an idea how that works. When you determine how many squares can I fit in my garden, you want to give those squares a number. So you just number one, two, three. My garden, one of my gardens has eight squares. So I just number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have two rows, four squares. And that means that on the left-hand side of my planning, I'm gonna number from up, from, from top to bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight because every horizontal line is gonna represent a 30 by 30 centimeter square, okay? I am gonna, I'm gonna switch screens. Um, so I'm coming back to you for a moment and then I'm gonna try and find my planning. And in the meantime, you might want to share some of your favorite vegetables in the chat so that I can actually work using those because I'm now gonna change, I'm gonna switch screens to my planner. So I'm actually gonna make a planning with you or for you, whatever you wanna call it, to show you how it works. But if I know what your favorite vegetables are, I can use those, which makes it kind of like a little bit more, um, well, less theoretic. Um, if you're working in pots, it depends on how big your pots are, Andaline. I mean, if you can only, if you, if you can only fit one square, if you would measure it and you would fit one square of 30 by 30 centimeters or maybe even 40 by 40 centimeters, yes, that would be one vegetable or one square per pot, but there also exist pots of 60 by 60 centimeters. So then you would actually divide it in four squares and then you can have, you have four squares within one pot. Oh, I see a mint. For mint, you really need a separate pot. So. If it's right, you can now see my planner and I am gonna explain you what it is. You see multiple boxes on here, but we're just gonna take, we're gonna take the empty one on box two. So as I said, every box of mine has eight squares and I have a system of kind of like numbering them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the next box, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And the little asterisks 
before people ask. My box and one side have a trellis, which I use for climbing plants. And they are, um, they have the asterisk. So if I have anything that climbs, I know I have to put it in those squares. So what I have is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at the calendar and we're going to say, OK, let's start gardening in March. So we just have a look at which vegetables can I actually sow in March. But we already discussed about the radishes. So let's take them as, um, as an example and let, them, let, let us put them in immediately as of the beginning of March. And we then see it takes four to six weeks before they're ready. So I'm going to take, it's still cool, it's early spring. So I'm going to take the full six weeks. Every little square on your worksheet tree is a week in the month. Radishes are from the gray family. So I'm going to make six little squares gray. And I'm going to put in that it is radish. So once I harvest my radishes, I am kind of like halfway of April. So what can we do in April? Well, we can do uh, carrots. Um, and they are from a different color family because they're orange. So we're going to put in here carrots. Carrots are going to take 10 weeks. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And we put in here carrots. By the time my carrots are ready and harvested, it's July. So let's have a look for um, vegetables I can actually sow in uh, July. Mm, let's see what we have. Um, maybe we do some Swiss chart, which is from the green family. Let's keep it nice and colorful. Swiss chart is about seven weeks. Yes. And then it's end of August. So that's kind of like the point where you can go start uh, choosing. Maybe I want to go already a little bit more towards the cold, colder season vegetables. Maybe I want to still give it a go. It's on the edge, but I am going to give it a go with a round of beetroot because August is kind of like the last month to sow them. And that is your first square. So by the end of the season, you have actually harvested four different vegetables from your one square, which is kind of like pretty productive for a tiny little garden of 30 by 30 centimeters. And as soon as you can kind of like enlarge it a little bit, we also have a lot more possibilities because we have a second square. So let's go for, let's say spinach. You can sow spinach already in March. So we make that green because it's the green family and it goes about eight weeks, which brings me towards the early, early May. And although maybe not immediately at the beginning of May, but in May, I, I need room for my transplant, so my summer vegetables. They can go in the second half of May, but that's perfect planning to put in my tomato, which definitely goes until the end of September. Because, of course, it just keeps on giving fruits. And then it's in October, and in October, I can still so my palm tree kale which is just like normal kale it's just growing upwards so it's ideal for um, a garden on uh, on limited space because it literally grows as a palm tree so it makes a stem with leaves and in contrary to a normal kale which kind of like grows wide it's like huge which is not ideal, of course, if you have limited space, but if it grows upwards, it's perfectly fine. It tastes the same. It has the same uh, health benefits, everything as normal kale. So 
that is my second square. So now I have two squares of 30 by 30 centimeters. And by the end of the season, I have seven different kinds of vegetables. And that's how you kind of like keep on growing. Now let's have a look at the trellis because if you have anything, it, it can be a trellis with netting, it can be sticks. So all the same is all perfectly fine. So let's in the beginning of the year, like early spring, uh, let's do snow peas. They go 10 weeks. As of normally around nine to 10 weeks after sowing, you can kind of like start harvesting. But here's a little bit the tricky thing. A pot, a plant that produces pots like beans and peas and a plant that produces fruits like tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchinis, they keep on producing those as long as they are kind of like flowering. So you can start harvesting after roughly eight weeks, but as long as the plant keeps flowering, you can also keep harvesting peas. In my, I mean, in my, in my case, I'm now building in snow peas. So I give myself a little bit more time to just, you know, get the maximum out of the plants and say, I take, I take two, two weeks extra, which is perfectly in time. It's end of May for another summer vegetable that actually wants to grow up. And that is, for instance, a cucumber. And again, all those summer, real summer vegetables normally do well until towards the end of September. And then we are in October. So there are so many kinds of lettuce that the ver winter varieties of lettuce, you can actually sow them in October and they just stay in your garden until you're ready harvesting them. And that can be in November, that can be in Dece December, that can have even actually be next spring. So that's how you kind of like build your garden plan. And it also now makes it probably easy to see if you really have a goal and you have an idea where you want to go, how much more you can squeeze in the little spaces, the little space that you might, might have, and also squeeze in more than many seasoned gardener with a big garden actually does. Doesn't mean they can't do it, but many just don't do it because they don't have, they didn't take the time and didn't put in the effort to actually make a plan and say, hey, how can I get the maximum out of my garden? And they just tend to leave their produce too long in the garden. And especially produce like a Swiss chard or a cucumber towards the end of the end of their growing life. First of all, the taste deteriorates. They don't produce as much anymore. And in the worst case, like a Swiss chard, which you actually grow to eat the leaves, it will start blooming. It doesn't taste nice anymore, but then all of a sudden, of course, it looks nice and people just leave it in and in and in and in, which in my opinion is just wasted time because I don't grow my Swiss chart to look nice. I grow my Swiss chart to eat. And as long as if it's not tasty anymore, in my case, I just say rip it out and put something new in. And if you want to have something that looks nice, choose one of the beneficial or edible flowers uh, and combine it that way. But don't have your vegetables that aren't supposed to bloom for your consumption. Don't have them blooming. And I know a lot of people, a lot of gardeners say, yeah, but I have a few. I always have a few that I keep uh, in the garden to bloom because then I can collect the seeds for next year. Yes, that is a possibility. Of course, you can do that. I personally think it's not the best choice if you are gardening on limited space as we urban gardeners do. There are perfect, um, there are colleagues of mine that don't grow the vegetables to eat, but they grow the vegetables actually to collect seeds. And I happily buy that, buy the seeds from them instead of having my whole square 
there with one plant just to collect a few seeds for next year. But that's up to you. You can do it. Um, it's nothing, there's nothing against it. It's just that I personally think it's a waste of space in my little garden as I want to eat from my vegetable garden and not reproduce. Um, but that's, uh, of course, always uh, up to, um, to everybody personally. So did you manage to kind of like work along with me a little bit? Or have you just been looking? Taken a lot of ideas. That's wonderful. Looking, planning, very useful. Yes. Okay. Then let me once again go to sharing my screen. So your planning, so this worksheet of you, in the end, should turn as colorful as possible. As I said, it is really important for yourself because it really keeps it varied. It makes it interesting to keep eating from your, uh, from your garden. It uh, makes sure that you kind of like balance everything. You don't create a huge um, mono, almost like a monoculture. And you also uh, really um, attract all the beneficial insects, um, uh, etc., and you keep your soil as healthy as possible. So that is this this whole process of making a plan is one of the little elements of um, your urban paradise course. I told you about a little bit earlier. It is in four weeks where we kind of like take I take you through the process of designing a garden ideal for your personal situation. So we look at your uh, balcony or terrace or garden. We look at uh, what you can do there, what you want to do there. I'll talk you through how you can build your ideal garden. And then we make, we're gonna make, go through the whole pro process in really detail about making your own uh, plan and to sow your garden. It is kind of like Lisa, Lisa did the course last year. She had kind of like a rough idea, but got totally overwhelmed by the amount of information available on the internet. And on top of that, a lot of that information was kind of like contradicting each other. So she was kind of like, what do I do? Where do I start? What can I do? What is really necessary? What not? She started, as I said, with an empty terrace last year, February. And she sent me this picture with her first harvest uh, ready to go about two, two and a half months later. So she really went from scratch through the process of the uh, Your Urban Paradise course where she got, and many others with her, uh, the four modules, as I said, design, build, plan, and so. It comes with uh, coaching videos weekly, explaining the essential techniques, um, going a little bit deeper into the different elements. We do a live Q&A every week. So you can ask me all your questions um, there that you have. We will meet kind of like on Zoom like now and um, you will get everything answered. And you get all sorts of downloadable worksheets like you have now in the little workbook uh, for this uh, course. Of course, it is a little bit more substantial then. And you get the digital garden planner as you saw me working in today so that you don't have to print out all you can fiddle around with the colors and your vegetables until you have the perfect plan. And then you print it once and you can keep it maybe like I do. I have a little box where I have all my seats and I keep my sewing calendar for that year with them. So every time I harvest something, I take my box with seats packages and I look at my calendar and I'm like, oh, okay, I want to, that square, I'm going to um, sow that next vegetable. A little a few more what others say about the course. Uh, Lorraine, she loved the environmental growing techniques and how much she could do with the 30 by 30 centimeter squares. Uh, Ira got the confidence that she could actually do it. And Cecile was so happy that I kind of like took away the complication and the overwhelm that a lot of people want to talk you into when it comes to 
gardening. So in four weeks, you can transform your balcony or terrace into a healthy, sustainable, and beautiful urban paradise, just the way you'd like it. And to give you some inspiration about what is actually possible on tiny little terraces or balconies, um, the top left is a garden like my, like, like the ones I have. It's the 120 by 60 centimeters. And the bottom left is actually my herbal garden, which is built up at, at with single unit bags. Um, that can also be re really helpful if you have um, a balcony or, or, or garden with um, shadowy spacious, be, spaces, because then you can kind of like move them around with the sun if necessary. In the middle, those are boxes of 90 by 60 centimeters. You see, they have the six squares. One is on the ground. The other is even elevated on a little table to make it even more comfortable. No bending, no uh, crawling around. Um, then you see one is a little bit bigger. It's 120 by 90. And the uh, really bottom right is like a single, single line all the way kind of like in a, well, it's a really tiny U form, but still. And if I look like that quickly, recognizing the different plants in there, it has at least 12 squares. So that means that actually in that little tiny little narrow balcony, you can grow 12 different vegetables at one time. And then of course, with re-sowing, um, you get easily up to 30 times harvesting probably in a year. And then on the top right, you see a, um, a rooftop terrace, I think it is. And it's actually built with only single units. So that would be comparable with Adeline, like with containers. That's, you know, how you can build them up, you know, all kind of different containers. This, this person uh, obviously has uh, the kind of like the plant bags that I, I also have. They're exactly 30 by 30 centimeters from kind of like a fabric, really breathable, really good for your, uh, for your vegetables. That is like uh, Jacqueline as well. She was last year in the course. She also started with an empty uh, balcony and she had her vegetables growing. And um, now you can um, start the course with, for just $197. So it's a little bit less uh, converted to uh, Swiss francs. And that's less than 50 per week, just to realize not only your garden or your garden dream, but also an investment in yourself, in your family and your environment, um, plus an investment to improve your health and general well-being for now, next year, and many years to come. Or as Karen said, it's the perfect place to start if you have a balcony and a gardening dream. And um, it is an absolute, it is an experience because gardening is so much more than just growing vegetables. Um, and that's also what we talk about in the course. It's how to take full advantage of all health benefits from gardening, not only just the healthy vegetables. And that was one too quick. It is for you. There is actually something for everybody, whether you are an absolute beginner, not being able to keep a plant alive before, or just have some pots on your windowsill and want to expand into a little bit bigger garden onto your gar on your terrace. Or maybe you even have a very seasoned gardener who wants to size down and not really know how to, how to do that, or reorganize your big garden making it easier to maintain and probably even more productive. So you get the course with the videos and the handouts every week, a new chapter to avoid overwhelming confusion. It's really step-by-step, step. my digital garden planner, a private Facebook group for support and inspiration, and a lot of fun, plus the weekly live with me to answer all your questions. And if you join me as one of the first eight, I still have eight of these beautiful shopper bags. Um, they're, they're just really cool. So if you're one of the first eight, you get one and you can go shopping for no longer for vegetables, but for everything else that you like to eat on the market or in uh, the supermarket, of course. How can you join? 
Well, you should have an email from me by now. It should be in your uh, mailbox with the link to the registration page. It's called Psst, because I just opened the door to your urban paradise. And the early bird price, I said of 197, so $197 uh, is valid for the next around 36 hours. So if you join before Wednesday, 8 a.m., um, you get it for the 197 price instead of the normal 297. And that is just as a thank you for me uh, for that you were here. I really, really loved meeting you. And now I have time um, to go uh, actually answer your questions. I am going to scroll. I'm going to enlarge my chat. And I'm going to scroll through it and see what we have. Let's see if I can find the first. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, the pots, Adeline, I already in between quickly answered. It's the, it's the, it depends on the size of the pot. You just have to imagine or in, in most extreme, just measure whether you can squeeze a square of a 30 by 30 in there. Um, Peter asked me, how deep are they? I, I suppose you um, refer to the, the raised beds to my gardens, they are only 25 centimeters deep. And that is uh, honestly actually plenty of, I, I even grow potatoes in there where everybody always says um, that you have to put them, I don't know how deep. Um, there, are, there are a few plants that's more, that wouldn't be suitable for a garden that way, but it's more because of the plant becoming so big. It's not because they need more uh, space or depth. It's just that they grow so huge that uh, you can't do anything else anymore. What do you mean by growing them in the same square patch pot? Um, Malvika, I think you mean, um, if I make my planning, the horizontal line, yes, that is one and the same square. So when I grow there, the radishes, once I have harvested them, harvested them all, I loosen the soil again. I actually scoop in a little bit of compost. And then, yes, I do plant or sow the next vegetable immediately afterwards. So that's what I mean in the same square. So I, I grow, har I grow, veg I grow radishes in one, in one square and then I harvest them. And then immediately after, I put in carrots and I grow them, then I harvest them, and then I put in the next vegetable. So that's how I do four, sometimes even five different vegetables in one square over a season. And as I have eight squares in my garden, I have, I normally harvest around 30 different vegetables from one or rounds of vegetables from one. A garden. Um, but there is also in your uh, workbook, uh, I think I did a sheet with what I on average uh, harvest from my one garden from 120 by 60 centimeters to give you an idea. Um, if that, if does that, does that answer your question? If not, put it, tell me, tell me in the chat, <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, Peter asked, would tomatoes need a trellis? Uh, tomatoes can also perfectly grow with a stick. So just a bamboo stick or the nice fancy curled tomato sticks uh, is, per is, is enough for tomatoes. But if you have a trellis, you can grow them uh, at, to the, at the trellis, of course. Okay, how many uh, plants you can uh, put in a square? Yes, of course, that depends on the on the type of vegetables, how big is the vegetable and normally on the, and on the seed packaging. I mean, within within easy urban gardening, I mean, there's so much I can do with you in an hour. Um, but yes, a sowing calendar within easy urban gardening also tells you the size of the vegetable. And based on that, you know whether you can plant one in a square or more like four or nine or even 16. But 
uh, on a on a packaging, it normally it actually also often not always but often says how much space there should be between uh, the 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 plants, and based on that you can figure out either um, sixteen nine four or one in a square. Peter has the issue of the sun with a lot poor lighting. Um, yes, Peter, there is. Um, it's one of the parts when, when, when within your urban paradise, what we do is within the designing is that you actually get a worksheet to really, uh, what you can do is like really write down, okay, when is the sun where? And then, then we can, from there, we can calculate the amount of hours of enough sunlight. And there are always vegetables that don't mind less sunlight uh, than others. Um, so there is, Yes, if you have a really, really shady balcony, there are some limitations, but it doesn't mean you can't grow anything because I also can grow in winter. And then, uh, well, they don't get sunlight for, for, for days and, uh, uh, without an end sometimes. So there, is, there are definitely options there. It just um, requires a little bit deeper look into the exact hours, uh, where does the sun come from? How is the temperature difference maybe? And then really go into which vegetables are possible and, and which are worth trying and which are maybe just hopeless and, 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 and you better not um, lose your time on. Doesn't the trellis block the light for the others? Um, well, that is normally you would if you have, if. If you think about the sun and you say, okay, the sun, my, my balcony is facing, my person, my balcony person is facing south. So normally I would place the trellis, of course, on the north side of my garden. Having said that, because my balcony is facing south, it is so hot that I actually turned my gardens around to have the trellis on the south side to actually create shade in my garden during summer um, to prevent my lettuce from burning. So that's what I said. There are so many options where you can kind of like figure out how, where to position, where to plant certain plants and that they won't be overshadowed. Sometimes you want them to be overshadowed. So there is a lot of options, but in, in, in theory, you would put the trellis, of course, just as the really high growing plants, you would put them on the north facing side of your garden to prevent the other plants from being overshadowed. Yes. Where would you recommend to get the seeds, samplings, etc., in Switzerland? I would definitely go to zollinger.bio in, uh, in Switzerland for seeds. Um, Samplings, uh, I would actually go to the your local Setzlingen market. Uh, so that's like your seedlings market uh, for for those or any good good garden center um, here in the area. I, I can't really remember Malfika where you're from. Was you, were you in Lausanne? Yeah, Lausanne. Okay, that I don't know. But in the area of Zurich, it's Hauenstein. It's perfectly fine for. Um, for seedlings or, or plants. And for seeds, Zollinger. Zollinger, I can put it in the, actually I can put it in the chat. Um, I have their catalogs. Uh, we have issues with insects, but a lot of plants, how do you deal with this? I lots of sun all day. Uh, ah. um, insects it's it's normally i mean it's often it is as it's because your garden isn't varied enough um if that is not the case um it's really the question what kind of insects what are you talking about there are a lot of uh, organic ways of of preventing them with beneficial putting beneficial flowers in your in your planning and in the worst case making your own uh, soap spray or alcohol spray 
Um, but it, it's really, really very um, depending on what what insects. I mean, I, I know I have amphids um, in my beans every year. I know that um, beans are very, very vulnerable and very uh, um, receptive for, for amphids. But I also know that the um, uh, ladybugs love them. So I normally leave them because I know my beans won't be affected. If you just wash them with, uh, with, um, with water, you will flush them all away. They won't harm your, your, the beans itself and um, other accent, uh, insects like the ladybug. Um, they love it. And um, we can't have enough uh, ladybugs in, in the world, I think. So I kind of like leave them just until, until I'm, I'm just done with harvesting all my beans and then I take the plants away and with that actually the amphids disappear from my garden as well because they just prefer the beans. Um, if you have lots of sun all day, well as I said I have my trellis on the facing south so I, over, I, I create shadow in my garden um, that way. Uh, let Peter lettuce dry parsley pak choy. Yes, they are. Those are good vegetables. Um, there are more options. Um, tomatoes. Yeah, I can imagine if you have a very shady uh, um, uh, balcony, Peter, that you gave up on them. Um, but there is, a, there is, there is. Um, yeah, you, first of all, of course, you have a lot of of lettuce varieties. Um, but if it's really shady, you could probably even have. Uh, spinach in in summer and um, Swiss chard you can you can actually grow always doesn't really matter um, yeah yeah so so there is there is more more possible than than just that but as I said tomatoes but um, maybe zucchini could work doesn't need too much sun uh might be an option to give it a try but yes tomatoes is tomatoes and peppers is 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 a no-go <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> but it's kind of like sorry to say because everybody always comes to me and says oh i want to grow tomatoes <laughs> it's kind of like a big favorite um but um uh yeah that 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 might be a, a difficult one so yeah, so I think I, I went through all the questions. If there are any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself and just um, tell me or ask me. That's absolutely no problem. Nobody, any questions anymore? All clear? Well, that's wonderful. <laughs> okay, well then I thank you once again for being here with me. Um, I loved it. I loved, I loved having you here. Um, and uh, yeah, I would. I mean, let me know how you get along with your uh, with your uh, with your plants. You know where to find me because you found me before. So uh, you can always give me a message, messenger, or or something, uh, a message on uh, on social media, or send me an email. Um, I'm happy uh, to help uh, help you out. So for now, I then say, have have a good evening. Thank you again for, for being here. It was really lovely meeting you.